he came home. Prepare yourself. That's terror. There are those here among us have not followed the path of righteousness. They have angered the Lord God and his indomitable wrath shall descend upon them. Let there go forth throughout the land the warning voice of the supreme sentinel that the road to the gates of Sodom is the road to evil and utter damnation. Let us pray. Hiya, baby. Listen, our date this weekend is off. Yeah, I've decided I'm definitely going to my school reunion. Ciao, baby. Now, knowing Mr. Touchdown, I'll bet your wife is a super cook. Oh, oh, no, she's not my wife. Uh, me and my wife are meat and potatoes, but on the road, it's strictly hamburger. Hey, what are we standing out here for? Let's go in. I've tried the doors. They're locked. There's got to be somebody inside. You've killed four people in cold blood. You call yourself sane? <laughs> I've killed five people. Frankly, I never felt better in my life. Oh, dear God, help me, please, 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 kill me, kill me, kill me. No, no! Now, we may walk in peace, my children. Go in peace with the knowledge that we have been redeemed. This is Hans Manship from House of Death, and you're listening to The Hysteria Continues. And indeed you are. Welcome back to the Hysteria Continues. Um, uh, this is episode 140, uh, and this time we are going to be going swimming in a lake with a two-thumbed, fat, fat-butted child um, uh, ripping off the omen and various kind of uh, having a class reunion massacre and all that that comes with it. Uh, of course, it's one of Nathan's picks. So how are you doing, Nathan? You're very pleased to be bringing us back to 1976. Oh, I'm very, very excited to discuss this film. Have you been redeemed, Justin? <laughs> well, in my opinion on this movie, well, it remains to be seen. I shall, I shall, be, <laughs> I shall uh, let it all out of the bag a little bit later. But um, uh, yes, it's going to be an interesting one to chat about. And um, Eric, how are you doing? Ciao, baby. I'm doing fine. Excellent. Ciao, baby. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. And uh, Joseph, how are you on this fine and sunny morning? Well, it's a little chilly here, unseasonably so, but did you also know that Class Union Massacre was originally set in a boathouse? <gasps> oh, in jokes. In jokes. A go-go. Yeah. The entire film was set in a boathouse. <laughs> yes. It would be kind of hard to get away from the killer there. Yeah, I'm going to send you the written the written word to show you that I'm correct. <laughs> oh, shut up, the whole lot of ye. <laughs> Uh, just to explain, we did um, we recorded a commentary for Arrow's upcoming release of The Slayer from 1982, um, uh, and um, we had a dis- disagreement, didn't we? Or we a misunderstanding, I should say, about. Uh... Hey, what's the misunderstanding? I said that you were we were talking about other slasher movies that have scenes set in boathouses, and I said that the start of Friday the 13th was originally meant to be set in a boathouse. And you were all like, no, it's not. You're so stupid. And then I got written proof that it was, and now none of you will apologise. No, well, we misheard you because we thought... <laughs> well, not when you act like that, Eric. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, I think it must be your mature uh, debating skills that uh, I am won mature. us over. But, uh, no, because obviously myself and Joseph knew that um, the boathouse scene was in the burning, meant to be in the burning at the end. And that's what we were talking about. And then, but you were you were whittering on about Friday Thirteenth. But I watched Friday Thirteenth um, the other night. I just put it on for uh, just to, to watch it, just something to, to background. And I didn't understand with the bit uh, at the beginning. You, it might as well have been a boathouse where he, um, where the killer kills off the two canoodling teens. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So it didn't make any sense why they wasn't in the boathouse. If that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I think it could have been in the boathouse. The only thing I read is that it was supposed to be like much more of a chase scene. So I know they trimmed it down for time, but I'm like you. I'm like they could have still done the exact same thing in a boathouse, right? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense why they wouldn't do it. It was a budgetary. It didn't, you know, unless it, they would. I have, mean, hmm. I'm sorry. I was just gonna say, I'm sure there's like balls of yarn that they could have thrown at Mrs. Voorhees in the boathouse. <laughs> yeah. But also, there's that that kind of infamous shot, isn't there, of the woman, the the girl being killed um, uh, with a machete to her neck that never made the final cut. 
So maybe she's still alive. Maybe she's still alive. Oh, no, don't go down that route again. <laughs> well, I'm glad we're covering Friday the 13th today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I wish we were. Great. Um, oh. <gasps> Anyway, anyway, um, before we get move on to the uh, the, the classic um, movie we're about to cover, um, uh, should we have a little chat about what we've been watching while we've, we've been off air? So, Joseph, would you like to go first? Sure. I um, I had heard a lot of things about uh, the Hulu show The Handmaid's Tale, mm. so um, I started watching that. Well, I watched the first episode. Um, I like the premise, which kind of ties in with Class Reunion Massacre with the whole kind of religious fundamentalism gone even crazier than it is. But my God, this show is so boring. I mean, the whole show is like filmed. It almost feels like it's filmed in slow-mo. It's like there's a slow-mo scene every five seconds, and I'm like, get to the point already. Um, you know, it's, it's really film, it's filmed really well and it's kind of intriguing, but at the same time, the pacing is so languid that I don't know if I can go back and, you know, pick it back up. Has anyone else seen it? Uh, yes. Uh, no, I saw no. the movie years ago, but uh, I haven't seen this miniseries, but it is, it's causing a sort of a big deal with critics and that over here. Cause I think it, it hasn't it debuted on, um, channel four or something, Justin. Mm, I think so. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, well, it's on Hulu over here, but uh, I don't know. I just I could not get into this at all. I'm the opposite. I really like it. I've I'm probably up to episode five, I think. And I do agree that it's it's very slowly paced, but to me, the craziness of the whole situation keeps me intrigued enough to keep watching. Um, I, it's one of those shows that I want to see where it's going to end up going because I really don't know where they'll end up going with this show and I haven't seen the movie or read the book or anything. So, um, you know, completely, uh, going into this blindly. The way you felt about, uh, true detective is the way I feel about this show. I'm like, well, it's neat, but boy, they See, can really pick up the pace a little bit. I get exactly where you're coming from because true detective was hailed by critics and fans alike, but I just, I just don't get it. So I know where you're coming from. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you, Joseph. Anything? Anything else? Um. Yeah. Just one more that I I know Nathan has seen. I'm not sure if you or Eric have seen it. Is a uh, party night, which was the um, uh, it's a low, low, low budget slasher from uh, one of our listeners, Troy S. Camilla. Uh, it's a '80s throwback slasher. And um, I'm going to forgive it of its uh, low budget faults and say that it's it's not a bad little movie. Um, for once, the characters aren't snotty for the sake of being snotty, and I liked a lot of the gore. Uh, ultimately, I think uh, no offense to Troy, I think it's it's just one of those. You know, I've seen this before in a lot of the more recent independent films. So, um, for me personally, uh, it doesn't really stand out except maybe for its pretty pretty really impressive gore effects but it's not an unlikable film it's definitely one i would recommend you know above the 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 glut of just trash that's out there right now so i definitely give it a recommendation i have seen it as well i watched it this morning um I like the fact that they're at this party house and they find their uncle's stash of video collection. And it was like, oh, my God, is their uncle Nathan by any chance? Because they have, <laughs> they have Halloween, they have Slaughter High, Mutilator and Splatter University. And oh, the, God. Yeah. It's like your That's idea. Yeah. I was a little upset that they spent the majority watching Dismembering Christmas, though. Was that what was on the screen when the guy was watching it? Yeah. Yeah, and he comes back in, and it's like rewound to the part where the uh, the blood drips on the girl's face. I'm like, you get all these movies, and you show dismembering Christmas. Well, I guess it's kind of a a rights issue. Yeah, a rights issue, obviously. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) But also, I think that uh, the writer of Dismembering Christmas was uh, one of the producers or executive producers on Party Night, so I I could kind of see why they did a little tie-in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, for, for for that. I, I really liked it. Um, you know, I think, you know, with, with movies like this and, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm even bringing up not before Easter, uh, the movie Joseph and I made, it's just when you have such a low budget, you just, 
uh, you can't expect the same, you know, kind of quality you get from even a low budget '80s slasher because a low budget slasher in the '80s was still, you know, probably you know, like hundreds of thousands of dollars, and that was low budget. Nowadays, well, it's like you got a couple hundred bucks, and that's your low budget. Well, Troy's film is definitely better than The Night Before Easter. I'll give him that. <laughs> in my in my opinion, in my opinion. Um, I thought, you know, that, uh, the, the cast did well. Um, you know, I didn't really notice anybody that, you know, was, was not, um, uh, you know, a good actor. I thought they, they, you know, they all did very well. Um, I love the gore. I thought the gore effects were a lot of fun. Um, you know, and, and actually to be, you know, 70 minutes long, it's the pacing, you know, is, is just fine. I didn't really have any complaints with it at all. Um, you know, and, and I know that me saying I liked a movie doesn't really matter much because of some of the other movies I liked, but, you know, it is what it is. I love, uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I thought that like, the acting was, was, was good, and um, I was surprised at the, the quality of the movie because you said to me it was it was a low-budget movie. Um, so, yeah, it delivered a lot more than I expected. The gore is terrific in it. Um, it's all practical effects, you know, not, not a CGI shot to be seen. Um, so it's, it's certainly bloody. Mm-hmm. I, I think what really helps it do is, I mean, you could really tell watching it that it's made by somebody who is a fan. Uh, well, if they, ref- well if they, if they sure. reference Splatter University and uh, Slaughter High, then obviously it's a it's a fan. Yeah, I tell you what, that movie won my heart when they referenced <laughs> Splatter University. <laughs> I was thinking of you as that scene came up. Yeah, <laughs> I I, really, I liked it. I thought it was. Um, I thought the the cast uh, did did really well, and they were actually it kind of addresses some of our issues about new slashes with like unlikable casts. I thought the the majority of um, uh, the cast were likable, and I thought that was, um, you know, that this had a definitely had a, that kind of charm charm to it. Uh, I, and, and like you say, the gore was the gore was great. I mean, it had some shortcomings, but it, you know, so they're saying cutting some slack considering the um, uh, the scarcity of the budget. But I, I think all things considered, it was kind of definitely um, I've seen a lot lot worse, and I thought it was it kind of zipped by. It was never boring. Um, and it kind of, um, you know, entertained and satisfied as a, as a slasher movie. Um, oh, that's the thing. That's the thing. Like, it was never boring, which mm. is a, a, a huge compliment because. Yeah. Yeah. Know, it's, only it's, 65 minutes. So yeah. it just kind of zips by. Mm. I mean, I was a little bit confused. I don't want to give the ending away, but um, about who the killer. Well, I don't know if they, if it was obvious who the killer was or if it was ambiguous, but um uh, it could have. It, it's one of those things. Sometimes you're down to if you do and down to if you don't. You don't want too much exposition or kind of backstory to a slasher movie. But some it, it, well, not to not to spoil it too much. But the one character says the one word that you want to hear to confirm it. But he says it so kind of like hushed and in like a whisper. So it's 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 very vague. Mm. Yeah. So it's kind of. It's difficult, but I, yeah, I, I definitely, it's it definitely. If you're a fan of slasher movies, then it's definitely worth your time um, to to seek it out. So I imagine it's going to be coming out. Um, and thank you, Troy, for giving us an advanced screener. That was very, very kind of you. And so, um, um, yeah, we, I think, you know, it's, you know, it's definitely worth uh, uh, seeking out when it's when it's out and available. I'm curious to see his Christmas slasher movie that he's um, working on right now. What's what's the name of that? Stirring. Mm, okay, cool. Yeah, no, excellent. Yeah, I'll be, I'll definitely be up for seeing that when that's out. So, okay, thank you, Troy. And so, um, uh, thank you, Joseph. Anything, anything else you wanted to mention? Uh, no, that's it for this week. Okay, thank you, um, Nathan. How about you? Well, I haven't seen anything uh, new, but I did um, rewatch The Descent with Wes. It was the first movie that we ever watched together. So uh, he doesn't really like horror movies uh, very much, but um, I was able to uh, talk him into rewatching that one at least. And I thought it held up great. I absolutely love The Descent. The only thing mm-hmm. I didn't like is the copy that I have doesn't have the original ending with it, which really bothers me because I love the original ending, even though I know with the sequel it doesn't really tie in anymore. But I think the original ending was... A perfect capper to the film. Yeah. But I mean, I'm a big fan of the movie. I think it's great. I love all the characters. You know, the action sequences are great. There's a lot of really good, you know, tense build up. And then once the action starts, it doesn't really let up. It's, it's just a great movie to me. 
Yeah, I'm, I would I've agree. Loved, yeah, yeah, I think it's, it's a great, a great little movie. Yeah, I, mean, I saw it at the cinema when it came out. I'm sure you probably did as well, Eric. Um, I did. I saw it twice actually in cinema because yeah. I loved it so much. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely sort of um, holds up, doesn't it? The, se- the sequel is probably a bit unnecessary, but um, but then most sequels are, I guess. I like the sequel. Yeah, but it's not. It's just more of the same, no, really, isn't it? Yeah, it is more of the same. Yeah. I can't even discuss the sequel. Why? Because I absolutely hate the way that it ends. I hate oh, right. that ending. That <laughs> ending ruined the whole movie for me because I hated it that bad. Well, there you go. Would you get so. to see one of the monsters doing a big poo? I know I mentioned that yeah, before, yeah. but that's that's like the the standout scene in that film for me. So it's like the Friday Thirteenth. Oh, Eric, you series. really are mature. I am mature. <laughs> well, thank you, Nathan. Anything? Anything else? No. No. Okay. You're just you're just itching to get to that class <laughs> reunion, aren't you? Um. So uh, I don't know if I've been this excited to discuss a movie with you guys. Okay, <laughs> right, okay, well, that uh, makes me a little bit frightened. Um, I think he's so, going to be broken-hearted <laughs> by the time we're through, though. I have this feeling. No, it's okay. The Redeemer, like, I'm just going to use some Redeemer quotes to offset, you know, the negativity. Okay, but who says there might not be any negativity? Who knows? Oh, maybe not. Maybe not. But, um, Eric, how about you? Well, are you ready for this? Mm. I have watched the... House box set. Hey! Finally, <laughs> yeah. after a month of waiting, it arrived. So, um, yeah, so this is the, the UK version of Arrow's house box set, which has the four films. It's released in the States as well with only the first two. So um, House One is, you know, a very fun, very 80s, fluffy horror comedy, which has a huge nostalgic appeal for me because it was one I saw back in the day. It's directed by Steve Miner, who, of course, had done the first two Friday the 13th sequels. And it's just a higgledy-piggledy plot about a house which has doorways to different dimensions and parallel universes and blah, 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 blah. So, I mean, there's not much to it, but it has lots of rubbery monsters and some hit-and-miss comedy moments. But I love it because it has that nostalgia factor for me. Um, House 2 is the same. It's a much maligned sequel. A lot of people hate it. Um, I think if I hadn't got nostalgic attachment to it, I'd probably hate it too because it, it is... You know, it has no plot, basically. And the comedy, again, is very hit and miss. But I, it has a super dishy caveman in it. So that's one of the hooks for me. Uh, House 3, I have less of an attachment with. And this is released as the horror show in the States. It's a much darker film, much more serious. Um, and it's a bit too close to Wes Craven's Shocker. And when it comes to Wes Craven's Shocker, I think that even a film like Axum is better than Shocker. So there you go. I hate Shocker that much. <gasps> yeah. I just find Shocker so like, boring. You don't like Horace Pinker, Eric? I don't like Horace Pinker. Now maybe I just need to rewatch it. I don't know, but I I just have never Yeah, I don't I don't remember Shocker being all that great either, but I don't think it's as bad as Axel, no. Yeah, no, no, I'm probably exaggerating. Yeah, I probably am. And then House Four is kind of a return to a sillier haunted house movie. This was a direct to video release uh, and it feels quite cheap. Uh uh, but it has William Cat back in it playing Roger Cobb, which was his character name in the first House movie. But he, he's playing a different character, which is kind of odd. But uh, the whole box set is lovely. It comes with a very lush uh, hardback book with uh, writings on all four films in it and you know, lots of stills, the original press materials. Uh, so it was well worth the wait and the extra expense I had to fork out. Excellent. OK. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um... I've not. I haven't seen the house uh, movies for ages. Again, I think it's slightly the slight difference in age. I kind of. I. Uh, it, they passed me by. They didn't really appeal to me that much. I must admit. Mm. They're, I mean, they're they're very much on a par with things like The Gate and Monster mm. Squad films mm. like that. Yeah. Uh, from the eighties. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you. Anything? Anything else? Uh, no, that was it. I was, I was that and Party Night, and of course the Slayer, which I was watching during the week. Yes, of course. Yeah. Um, just before I mention what I've been watching, I'm just going to also mention I've, I, I said on um, on Facebook on the Syria Libs um, Facebook site that I, I, it looks like my book um, Teenage Wasteland will be out next year again in an updated edition. So uh, very excited to be doing doing that. So if you were looking to buy a copy because it's it's out of print, so it's it's been going for sort of silly kind of money. So if you hold off, then there will be a, a, a super duper new edition out uh, hopefully next January or February. So you heard that here first, or or a few days ago on my on my Facebook group. But uh, so um, you better get to work. Yeah, I know. Um, so so that. But as far as what I've been watching, I think last time we recorded, I think I just started Slasher the. Um, 
the slasher slasher kind of TV series, eight part TV series, which was originally it was on some cable channel I think in the states, but it's been it's on Netflix in the UK now, um, and I think it came out last year, but it's only just been on Netflix in the last month or so. And I think I'd watched about two or three episodes uh, last time, if I'm remembering correctly. And I know Joseph's seen it, but I finished it now. Um, it's kind of definitely worth a watch. It's very silly, very gory. Um, and it's got like a killer who looks like a giant butt plug, um, which was certainly, <laughs> certainly an interesting choice. Um, What's a butt plug? Um, it's, I thought um, he looked like a, a big black dildo with like a reservoir tipped condom up on yeah. him. Well, it's kind of yeah. crossed between a, a big black dildo and a, a butt plug. So it's kind of a butt plug. It's something if you've got if you've got a leaky bottom, Eric. We know what, what a butt plug is. I don't. <laughs> I sure. think if anyone if anyone knows what butt plug is, it's going to be you, Eric. Um, <gasps> I dare you. <laughs> but um, yeah, he's he's going round um, killing <clears throat> people um, for seven deadly sins. Basically, it's that old chestnut that's being utilised, um, uh, and actually has a tie in. I kind of guess with um, the the, um, the redeemer uh, later on, and um, it all kicks off because a, a woman moves back to a town where. Um, bizarrely, she rents out the house where her parents were brutally murdered by the butt plug killer, and she was cut out of her pregnant mother's womb. Uh, and so she moves back to town, moves back to town, and moves into the same house where her parents were brutally murdered, which is a curious choice. Um, and then she becomes best friends with the killer, bizarrely, um, um, as new murders start across the town. Uh, and it's kind of it's quite good, apart from. It's a bit, yeah. I mean, without giving it away, the the killer it turns out the who are, the person who's the killer basically has nothing to do, re- well, not nothing to do, but certainly the motivation for the killings has nothing to do with the mur- the original murders. Which the whole way through the uh, the series, you're kind of build trying to work out who's who's the killer is because and finding out more and more backstory. But it does have scenes like a prom queen having a breeze block dropped on her head, and and also the um, the the killer's reveal. Is um, uh, is is one of my favourite moments again, without giving anything away. But uh, in a, a kind of a, a kind of yearbook style photo, you see the connection with the killer, and uh, how they how they kind of outed basically in a in one of those kind of perfect stupid slasher movie. And I say stupid in an affectionate way. Um, it's kind of like a, I know what you did. I still know what you did last summer. Kind of um, reveal. So that that was good, and it's. Um, it, uh, it's got. I think there's a second series coming out. Um, it's being made at the moment, but it's an, kind of antho- not anthology, but it's a completely new story. So, um, uh, are they cancelled it? No, it's being made at the moment. Well, I think it's being made at the moment. I, I did see. Um, I think on IMDb, there's. Uh, it's yeah. I think it's in production. Hmm. But uh, you saw it, didn't you, Joseph? Yeah, um, I thought it started out really well. It's kind of you know macabre and gory. It got si- sillier as it went along, mm. and um, I actually didn't finish the last two episodes, so uh, I, I just couldn't really you know force myself to watch it. But one thing I, I really liked about it was uh, you know without trying to spoil too much, but basically what it boils down to is that she goes to visit someone over and over and over again. And she calls him on the phone over and over again. And then there's this one scene where she, uh, she goes to visit this person and he's like, what are you doing here? This is so unexpected. And she's been doing it like 10 times per episode. <laughs> I, just, I just thought that was a funny little moment, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, it's kind of silly, but you've uh, Nathan and uh, Eric, you've not seen it. Have you? No, no. I'd recommend you watch it. It's, it's a fun time waster. Um, uh, you know, it's got it's got some really good um, chase scenes in it, and uh, uh, it's quite it's kind of campy. It doesn't possibly go campy enough, but it's um, it's uh, kind of worth your time. But uh, yeah, so that's what I I saw. Um, I also saw uh, a film, uh, some films that came through on Love Film. One was called Viral, which is a Blumhouse um, film, I think. And I I kind of I just kind of I just sort of didn't have much expectations for it and it wasn't a great movie but it was it's one of those curios that is kind of like a relatively big budget um what well, it kind of turned out I think it was like a teen it's not basically teen horror but it was um with this kind of zombie style virus outbreak but people who were basically being taken over by parasites um and um you've got these teenagers trying to survive in their kind of um uh, their sub- suburban kind of cul-de-sac kind of like the kind of et those type of places that built out in the desert um as people start getting taken over by these kind of parasites 
uh, but it was kind of it was kind of it had a real big budget polish to it, or certainly medium Hollywood budget polish. Um, but it didn't quite it it didn't it's quite entertaining, but it didn't quite it, it had something missing, kind of intangible. It, it's, it couldn't quite put a finger on it, but it it was possibly the reason why it, it was dumped straight to um, streaming and uh, and uh, DVD. Uh, has anyone else seen that? No. No. Never heard of it. No. Well, there you go. And that's kind of a show. But it's considering it was, I think it, I think it was a Blumhouse production. So um, the other film I, I watched last night actually was Tales of Halloween, which is another anthology, um, uh, so which is uh, ten tales. Uh, again, with quite a high high budget, relatively high budget, um, um, a, a sort of a kind of very fast moving anthology of kind of kind of EC. EC Tales, that kind of um, creep show kind of feel to it. Uh, you know, you had tales like um, pumpkins um, coming to life and biting off people's heads and eating children and running around, um, police chasing around the streets with them, growing tentacles like the, the head and the thing. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of ghoulish, uh, you know, sort of just lots of ghoulish things like children turning up trick or treating and killing people, that, that type of stuff. Has anyone, anyone seen that one? I've I think seen I it. have. I think I have. Yeah. Yes. Um, I remember liking it a lot, but I, but I, I'll be damned if I can remember anything about it now. Mm, mm. It's kind of. I, it was a. It, I think my possible criticism with it. I mean, it, what it was was because it was ten ten short segments in the space of nine, presumably like ninety minutes. Is that you? Each one has less than well whatever that is, sort of um, nine minutes each or probably eight minutes each. It's linked with Adrian Barbeau sort of doing, reprising her um, kind of a DJ, radio DJ kind of, um, she's sort of talking over it. So it's got like, it's just like a fun 80s kind of throwback of those kind of sort of, uh, you know, that those kind of 80s creature feature kind of monster mashups um, uh, that, you know, had that kind of fun feel to it. So, yeah, that's definitely, def- definitely I thought was Yeah, I remember thoughts. loving the um, the portion with the with the pumpkins eating people that's all i can really remember from it and funny enough that was that was neil marshall who was the director to the same oh was it yeah. all right so um but uh yeah so that was that the only other film i saw uh, we've spoken before was i saw the the um the shallows with the um with the unlikely friendship with the seagull and the killer shark. oh yeah uh was it i thought that, I thought that was a great movie. little movie yeah no it was fun fun little movie yeah that was good that was that was entertaining so but i think um i i think joseph's talking about that at some length in, in a past episode i honestly i don't remember if i saw that or not it seems oh. like i did but i've forgotten it but i don't know i need to watch it what i haven't seen it you haven't seen it it's definitely worth a watch it's kind of you've got like it blake lively isn't it she's um yeah she goes swimming at a beach in mexico and uh there's a killer shark there and it's quite deserted apart there's a few people kind of surfers and people come and go but um she gets stuck on a rock with a seagull um and they they form this kind of this kind of friendship which is quite curious it's quite it's quite quirky um, because the seagull's also in injured wing, and it's her trying to, her and the seagull trying to get away from the shark. Um, cool. It's kind of well. Yeah. I hope the seagull and the shark don't die. Well, I can't give anything away, but if you've seen Jaws, you probably know what happens to the shark. But certainly, I'm going a... to see Jaws at the drive-in tomorrow night. Are you? There was a drive-in. Yeah. You got a drive-in? Yeah, in it's a, well, yeah, it's a it's a impromptu pop-up drive-in with a giant with Europe's giant <laughs> Europe's largest LED screen. So it's not strictly a uh, 30, it's not a 35 mil okay. drive-in like you'd get in the States. But Eric's sure. going to use his jaws. <laughs> to what, do what? In the he's back gonna seat. Be, he's going to be, he's gonna be uh. snogging in the car, aren't you, Eric? <laughs> snogging. With a, big, with, a big, with, a big, with a big Kit Kat bar. That's it, yeah. Is it actually, Chunky, you yeah. actually drive it? Is it a kind of, you take a car? Yeah, no, you, so. yeah you, you do, you drive into it. It's been shown in Dublin Port. So it's by, it'll be by the sea. Excellent. Okay. Well, that sounds like fun. Well, they're showing they're showing Jaws in um, somewhere in the states in, te- in a lake in Texas, I think, and you, you sit in a rubber ring and watch it on a big screen. Mm. Well, I imagine there'd probably be sort of you can imagine all the people sort of uh, swimming underneath and sort of putting oh. shot fins on their backs. Did you see that? Was that yeah. somewhere in the news? Wasn't it about um, some guy who did that recently and then got harpooned by loads of people? Where's <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. So. Wow. Um, Cool. Okay, excellent. Well, um, that's our recently seen. So, I guess, um, we can't put it off any longer. Six former members of a high school clique are surprised to find the school locked and deserted on the day of their 10-year class reunion. Through a series of flashbacks, the six are introduced. John, the lawyer, more interested in money than justice. 
Cindy the promiscuous beauty, Terry the glutton, Jane who has killed for pleasure, Roger the conceited actor, and Kirsten the lesbian. Concerned that they are the victims of a joke or a mistake, they are hesitant to enter the building when the caretaker invites them in. The strange, eerie man says he knows nothing about the class reunion, but directs them to the gymnasium where a spectacular banquet awaits them. John feels uneasy about the situation and decides to call the authorities for some answers. His suspicions turn to panic when the phone goes dead and they find themselves inescapably locked in the building. A frantic effort to escape begins when they realize that the caretaker is actually a murderous imposter, possessed by an evil spirit, and determined to kill them all. One by one, the students are stalked and attacked by the mysterious killer in methods of terrifying suspense and gruesome detail. The party is over, as this is the night scheduled for a class reunion massacre, a terrifying film you won't want to miss. That's the back of the video box blurb that I actually took from Justin's site. I actually changed a couple things around because they say the the night of the 10-year reunion. I'm like, no, they get there in the daytime. And they also misspell Kirsten's name. They call her Kristen. Um, But, you know, aside from all that, you know, I am a huge fan of Clash Reunion Massacre, a.k.a. The Redeemer. I think it's a a very atmospheric. And at times, I think it's a, it, it can be a very scary film. Um the, I mean, the idea of the Redeemer being this kid coming out of the water, I mean, it, it's a little funny when you think about it. And there's a, a kid in the movie that reminds me of a combination of Justin and Eric because he tells a joke and the, you know, demonic kid that came out of the lake didn't laugh at it. So on one hand, he's a bully, Justin. And on the other hand, he gets upset that nobody laughs at his joke and threatens to slit a kid's throat over it, Eric. I was thinking that very same thing as I watched the film. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I think the cast all, you know, do a great job in this film. I think the music is fantastic. I particularly love, and we talked about uh, this a little bit. You know, you guys know that I do the uh, Made for TV Mayhem podcast with Amanda Reyes and uh, Dan Budnick. And we were actually, before our last episode, we kind of discussed Clash Reunion Massacre just a little bit before we actually recorded the episode. And Dan was talking about how one of his favorite scenes in the movie is the moment where you see, you know, the people drive into the reunion and the killer is pouring, you know, the um, the paint or whatever over the plaster and just the, the music kicks in. And I was thinking when I watched it again last night, I was like, that really is an, a great scene. I think it's a great buildup to, for them getting to the school. I think the location of the school is, um, is very well, you know, uh, creepy. Um, also I think the killer is definitely scary. I love his, uh, Phantom of the Opera, you know, um, get up when he's on stage, uh, doing, you know, his little play with that weird little doll, you know, that is, I guess, I guess that's a little bit supernatural. Cause I don't think that was supposed to be a human. Um, inside a doll. I mean, but then again, it is Clash Reunion Massacre. We don't know because the movie seems to take place in some weird alternate universe. Um, but I, I like, um, particularly, I mean, it's hard to say this because I, I think the scene is very well done, but it, to me, it's kind of a hard to watch scene is the scene with um, the Redeemer and the clown mask and Cindy and the, the bathroom when he's, you know, kind of tormenting her before he drowns her in the sink. And uh, I think that's uh, a pretty you know, rough scene to, to watch because I feel like they both did such a great job. Uh, I thought Janetta Arnett was fantastic in that scene. I mean, that I thought she did some great acting because, I mean, she really looked terrified in, in, uh, in that moment. So I thought, you know, that was a, a standout scene. I love the Grim Reaper um, scene where he's hitting the the gate with the the scythe in in front of Kirsten. That was a, a great scene as well. Um, I think the movie, you know, and I think I really feel like a lot of it's open to interpretation. I mean, it doesn't connect all the dots for you. Um, you know, I've seen uh, someone mention that there's a shot of the cast at the banquet table eating that sort of looks like the the painting of the Last Supper. And with all the religious, um, you know, overtones to the movie, I could kind of see that uh, watching it this time. But I'd never really put that together before. 
So I thought that was a really interesting thing that I, I saw on this uh, newer version, or not new, this time I watched it recently, I mean. Um, but, no, I mean, there's a ton, and I'm sure we're going to get into a lot of uh, our interpretations of the film, so I won't go on and ramble too long at the beginning. So, uh, Eric, what would you think of Class Reunion Massacre? Well, Nathan, I'm just so sick of slasher movies that start off with a weird boy with a huge arse venturing out of a lake <laughs> and then making an extra thumb appear on someone's hand. It's like, oh, get some new ideas, Hollywood. Oh, no. It's the oldest cliche in the book. Um, now, back in the day, I probably, from what I remember, I, re- I did rent this back in the 80s because The Redeemer was available on my local shelves. And um, I don't think I cared much for the film because it was just too weird. But now I love the movie because it's just too weird. Um I can't make sense of that op- the opening 10 minutes of the film at all uh, and the closing either. It, it, it's bookended by these just bizarre um, sequences. I mean, who's the boy in the lake? You know, what's the deal with the extra thumb? Who's this Bible salesman that sort of has a really peripheral role in the film? Uh, he seems to be a major character, but not a major character. I'm not sure who he is. Um, it's It reminded me very much of Skullduggery. I just have haven't a clue, like what's going on in those opening minutes or those closing minutes. The bit in between is a more traditional slasher. It's still weird, but it's it's more a, of a traditional slasher movie. Um, so once, you know, once the bizarre prologue is over, um, I found the scenes in the school very atmospheric. Um, I thought there were some really bona fide scares in there. Like you said, the scene where he is dressed as death and he has the skull mask on and he's, you know, lashing at the window with the scythe. I thought that was really creepy. Um, and just the whole ambient, there's just the weird off kilter ambience just makes it a very, very strange and eerie movie, I think. Um, I mean, we were doing our commentary track for the upcoming release of The Slayer, as we were saying earlier in the program. And uh, we were talking about the dream logic approach of that film. And that's um, amped up to an even greater degree here, I think. The film certainly has one foot in a traditional slasher movie and one in, you know, a sort of a supernatural oddball movie. Um, it belongs to sort of an elite group of, of slasher, oddball slasher movies from around this time. Um, you know, Skullduggery, The Outing, a.k.a. Scream and Day of Judgment. Uh, all, I think we've covered some of them previously, but they all have that sort of weird um, almost like they were making it up as they go along kind of feel to the film. Um, I didn't find the religious nature of the plot to be overbearing at all. I know um, in if you go to the history of lives and you look at Justin's review of um, uh, his old review of um, uh, Class Reunion Massacre, uh, that you find he found that sort of plot point a bit, uh, you know, distracting. Uh, I didn't find it at all. I, th- I don't find it a pro-Christian movie at all. I find it anti-Christian, to be honest, because... Um, you know, you find yourself siding mostly, if not at all, if not with all the the classmates who are brought to the reunion. I mean, they they're being punished for sins that aren't that excessive, so they're fairly likable. Particularly the character of um, is it Cindy? Is yes. One has, yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, they're they're yeah they are being punished for sort of not terribly excessive sins, but I think that's poking fun at Christianity rather than saying that these people deserve it. Uh, that's the way I, I view the film anyway. Um, so, overall, of all the films we've covered in recent in the recent months for the podcast, I'd say this is the one that I've loved the most. I mean, it just grows on me more and more the more I watch it. Um, uh, I absolutely love it. And I don't care that I don't understand the opening or the closing of the film. I think that just adds to the appeal that it's so mysterious. Um, and I'm hoping that we never discover what the meaning is, because it might take away some of the impact of the film. Um, so a huge, a huge two, four thumbs up from me because I love the Redeemer, and I'm, I am like you, Nathan, really intrigued to see what Justin's, you know, updated opinion is on the film. Oh, definitely, and I am actually pleasantly surprised that you chose one of my picks to say it's been one of your favorites in the last few months. I know, That's isn't that bizarre? Isn't that I know. bizarre? Yeah. You won't feel that way when I do my Death Nurse double feature, but yeah, it'll that's be back a long to, ways yeah. off. Yeah, normal uh, service will be resumed. Then. <laughs> uh, Joseph. Okay, well, uh, Class Union Massacre or the Redeemer or Redeemer Son of Satan or whatever you want to call it. Uh, certainly an oddball proto slasher. And uh, I kind of say that as high praise as it's, as it's one of my favorites of the kind of the, the pre Halloween slasher films, quote unquote. Uh, to say the film is mean spirited would be an understatement, sure. Uh, but I like to think of it as sort of a cautionary tale of the poison that is religious fundamentalism. 
and uh, maybe never a cinematic case was made, say, for maybe the documentary Jesus Camp uh, for secular morality and atheism in general. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, we're going from like a mythological standpoint and taking into account the son of Satan title, was it the devil himself who rose up from the, the waters to use the priest as sort of a conduit to hyperbolize the construct of sin? Uh, I like to think of it as, as sort of a, a moral chess ga- game of chess. The devil rises up, says to God, look, you say this is wrong and needs to be punished. Watch me do this. Um, of course, it's more than a little vague and um, just kind of postulating on that. But uh, but the film's kind of exposition is never really made ultimately clear, you know, save for maybe that uh, quote unquote will return from the watery depths of hell text uh, placard at the end. Uh, but the religious connotations being whatever they may, I think the the reason why Class Reunion Massacre works so well, as well as it does, is because, you know, despite the film's kind of unclear supernatural undertones, it, it it is steeped in sort of a realism, especially in regards to its kind of preaching, vile, reprehensible killer. You know, I think Michael Myers and Billy from Black Christmas, they kind of perfectly embody the the silent boogeyman and the shadowy but voluminous psycho respectively. But I think the guy here reminds me of, you know, so many religious nut jobs you hear about on a daily basis, you know, calling to memory stuff like the guy in a tragedy, even though this kind of predates that Holocaust by like a year into change, uh, you know, theological nut jobs, flying planes into buildings for their deity of choice and self-important martyrs like that heifer who wouldn't sign gay marriage license because it conflicts with their faith. I don't know. It's all just so gloomy and raw. Uh, and it's got really excellent cinematography and I love the subtle piano score. Um, and these are characters you really kind of feel sorry for as well. You know, being quote unquote punished for archaic nonsense in the name of something you can't even prove exists. I don't know, be it the devil or God himself. Now, to me, that is scary. Just these kind of people who go out and kill in the name of something that, you know, you have no proof exists. Uh, You know, finally, I think T.G. Finkbinder is the redeemer. Uh, I think he's very, very good in his role. So uh, three thumbs way up for me. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. It's time, Justin. (laughs) What's your opinion? Okay. Well, I love hate this movie basically i kind of um no i i honestly have you a hate bit, it i love i have a love hate relationship with it i think um and my opinion hasn't changed massively from my review if i'm honest i still i i love the weirdness i love the um a lot about the movie uh i i kind of i you know i'd, I'd like the, the you know what the fuck opening and um all the kind of strangeness and the fact is that i think if it had all been like that then the film would have been if it had all just been completely random stuff happening and just kind of throughout the fact is it does have a kind of a kind of body count section um you know with with the murders kind of helps it kind of anchor it a bit um i like the characters i i thought there was um some real humanity there with with them which is sometimes missing from uh, slasher movies um i you know i I've, i really like the, the the kills i thought the you know as, as eric was saying i think it's the you know the, the scene with the the killer in um a skull mask with the scythe outside the window is a window is gen, genuinely quite sort of frightening um uh you know i like the whole idea of the kind of you know the class reunion people coming back and it's it's kind of pre preempts uh, an awful lot of slasher movies um and certainly you know it was kind of almost not quite, but certainly uh, it was the direct inspiration of the films like Slaughter High. Um, however, I still find the um, the religious stuff kind of um, problematic for me. I still find the idea. I've seen some people say the fact that it has two gay characters it's kind of a sign of being progressive, but I think that I don't really buy that. I think it's um, uh, if anything, it's kind of anti that. I th- I think the, the difficulty is is that we don't know. Nobody knows who or what the director had in mind when he dreamt this up. I mean. Uh, from what I've read with the interviews with um, uh, with some of the cast, there's nobody, just nobody knew. You know, I don't even know if the director himself knew. I think the whole Son of Satan thing is interesting, but I think um, from what I've read is the film was made before The Omen, but was kind of retrofitted to um, 
to try and sort of uh, piggyback on the back of that uh, that film's success. So I think the Son of Satan thing potentially was just added as a way of kind of um, fooling audiences into thinking they were seeing some kind of Omen-esque kind of movie. Um, what the whole thing was with the two thumbs and the, the fat ass kid coming out of the lake, I, you know, who who knows? Um, it's kind of it's what I love, you know, I love about 70s movies that they, they you know, have this kind of weird hangover from the 1960s of I took, people took too much acid and they made they got hold of a video camera or a, <clears throat> a movie camera and they came. They did make some really weird movies in the in the um, the first half to the mid 1970s. And uh, and, and certainly there's nothing quite like the Redeemer. Um, but I do, you know, I find I, it just it turns me off the kind of mean spiritedness of it, especially like the, the killing of the um, uh, the woman in the shower stall, you know, scrubbing her face. It's kind of I I, I just find it difficult to watch, um, and I find it difficult to get any enjoyment from those the, the scene, that scenes like that. So, so having said that, you know, I think I probably like it a bit more than I did when I originally saw it. When I originally saw it, I probably reviewed it. I was, you know, measuring it against other uh, slasher movies. Um, so certainly seeing it in its kind of place in, 19, you know, um, 1976 and the irony, of course, it not being released until 1978. So I'm not sure if it was pre or post Halloween, probably pre Halloween. But certainly it's an important film in the kind of proto slasher canon. Um, uh, and if you like 1970s what the fuck movies, then it's definitely worth checking out. But I, I, I think it's interesting the, the take that potentially it's it's anti-religious rather than pro-religious, and I think it, but it's very difficult to know um, I, exactly what that is. But the whole idea that you know you've got, it's, you've got killers brought all these characters together because they have perceived sins, um, it kind of so it could be seen as a kind of a moralizing uh, approach, or it could be as, as you know Joseph sort of set up a, put forward, it could be sort of a actually attacking kind of the religious fundamentalism um, as being a destructive force. Um, so it's it's difficult to say. I mean, I liked it more than possibly my review suggested this time, but I still have problems with the movie. All right, all right. I'm actually surprised you liked it a little bit better. Um, I'm surprised but... you didn't actually warm to it at all. I'm really surprised. Uh... I thought, because you have changed your mind on certain films over the years, and I thought this might have been one of them as well. Yeah, and I'm surprised it's not butter. <laughs> of course, it, I can't believe it's. Not I can't butter. believe I it's not so. butter. I think it's because yeah. I just think actually I just thought I kind of still agreed with my review, and sometimes I've like, said my my views of things have changed um, on on films with with some distance from original review, and certainly kind of its its place in time. But I still I still. Um, you know, it's still kind of, I, it's still the bits that I really like, um, but there's, I just, I find that, I find, I, I, I don't know, it's something, something about the movie, I just find it a bit too grim. Um, is it, is your main problem that the kid has a fat arse? Is that it? Uh, no, but it's, 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 no, it's not, that's not the main problem, but the main problem <laughs> for me is the, is the kind of, I mean, the fact is it, it's, it does something right in so much that I like the characters and I don't like the fact that they die and they die in quite, quite uh, you know nasty kind of ways you know you've got like i mean you've got yeah well, it's not it's not exactly hostile or or saw no but i'd say to be honest uh, the the murder of the the woman you know she's seen as the floozy and she's she's has a face washed in a sink and the, the you know it kind of um you know all the characters have have kind of deaths that which are kind of not all of them but most of them have deaths which are kind of somehow relating to who they are um it's like the gay character gets stabbed through the head with this kind of scimitar which is kind of like a kind of a, a, it's basically basically being saying he's been stabbed with a cock basically isn't it and he's been punished it, for punished oh justin <laughs> but no it, going, it, <laughs> do they ever you're outright you're say that he's gay they don't outright say he's gay no he's just a bit camp and effeminate and he's an actor but that's all they that's all they say, I think. Because I know that when he's talking about Roger, he's mainly talking about him for being, you know, vain and conceited. Yeah. And, and Kirsten, though, he is very specific about, you know, her being gay is the reason that he's killing her. But I mean, he never really says that Roger being gay, which has always led me to wonder, like, was the actor, you know, just kind of, you know, uh, you know, effeminate in, in, in camp, um, you know, or was the character supposed to be? Hmm. 
Well, it's, I mean, he de- he definitely came across as a kind of stereotypical seventies kind of gay character, you know, sort of uh, you know, sort of flouncing kind of. Um, whereas the the lesbian character didn't, you know, wasn't wasn't really painted that way. So it's I don't know. It's kind of you know we could spend we could spend hours you know days as we could we could write a book on. Do you know who we need? We need Amanda Reyes to. With, yeah. with her, I know. <laughs> with her Great analytic her brain. Yes. Mm. One thing, one thing I learned from Justin's review is that he might want to rethink um, his stance on veganism because there's one point in his review where he, he's talking about how someone likes to shoot live pigeons and he's I, like, "That's I nothing noticed, to get in a twist over." I know, Justin. That as well. Just, Justin. Oh, Justin. What the? As the I didn't meant. You said, yeah. He said that killing, shooting pigeons is oh, it's not something to get into flap about. No, no pun intended. Well, I maybe I would certainly really think, really think that. Obviously, I don't like any movies that have got kind of real animal slaughter in them, and so there's certainly a dead pigeon in in this. But... Well, you know, it's funny because it brings up what you said earlier about the people dying. You know, based on who they are. I mean, she ends up getting you know shot. You know, with, with a shotgun, just like she shoots these pigeons herself yeah. so you know i mean that's definitely one of those you know here's one for the pigeons and the the, yeah. the dodgy lawyer gets burned and he's really <laughs> burned loads of clients uh, i thought the Met- scene metaphorically what about the lawyer gets shot in the head oh yeah sorry who gets burned then what the, the glutton oh the glutton oh just like a I thought this, like a big mac the, overdone. Uh, <laughs> i thought the scene with the uh tg finkbinder the redeemer and the lawyer where they had that kind of standoff I thought the acting was just really well done in that scene. I want to know what was under his wig. <laughs> yeah, because he says, you know, remove my wig, see me as I really am. You know what I wonder is, and of course, this would be odd, but it is an odd film. But did the Redeemer, do you guys feel the Redeemer went to school with these people and he actually knew them from high school? I mean, he had the yearbook. I was wondering and, that as well, yeah. But like when he's standing with John at the end, um, I mean, he his costume is. I mean, his he don't have any makeup on his face. I mean, I would think that John would recognize him if he knew who he was. I don't think. I mean, my interpretation is that that boy that came out of the lake was actually some kind of physical manifestation of the devil, and he just possessed some random priest because his his thumb disappears at the end and goes back to the little boy before he goes back into the water. So mm. the devil or whoever the hell is behind it god the devil whatever is basically just using him as a conduit to enact all this kind of self-righteous mumbo jumbo and then once he's done he gets this conduit what like mustard conduit (laughs) that's my joke of the week i just oh do you have a joke of the week i don't i don't have a joke of the week but i've just done it there put him on the spot justin no don't i don't have a joke (laughs) No. Joke of the week. So, so I can't Come on, Eric. You Come can't on. do it. You can't oh, do very, it. There you go. Nathan has done the joke of the week. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to steal it from it. you. Yeah. That was pretty good, actually. That was it was. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just like the fact that the um, that the kind of the the bus knows to come and pick up that the um, the fat ass choir boy from the lake. Yeah, so, it's, not even a, it's not even a bus stop. It's the middle of nowhere. Exactly. So it's that of... would not happen in Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you guys like all the characters in the the class reunion? Was there any of them that you didn't really like that much? I suppose. I, I suppose thinking... the glutton. I suppose would be the most. Oh no, he's not that bad. None of them are that bad. And he's either. not that bad either. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was thinking. I think it's interesting because we talked about it earlier that they're really being killed for sins that really are not that bad you know i'm reminded a little bit of serial mom you know where the teacher gets killed and they're talking about it and um you know ricky lake uh, misty she uh (laughs) says to chip you know you said you hated him and he's like well he was an asshole but he didn't deserve to die it reminds me "Hmm." of it It reminds me of the the woman who does a recycle he's like i think someone ought to kill her (laughs) yeah kill someone because they don't recycle that's (laughs) anyway what do we think of who is the kid in the back of the jeep at the end of the film? Is that the one? The who bully, was, isn't it? Is the that bully. the bully? Yeah, yeah, I'm assuming the bully who, who's who did the brilliant joke about the whore. That's the one, yeah. I think. Yeah, the I, sailor, I, I, and he met this whore. Yeah, <laughs> but he's pronounced it weird. He calls her a whore or something. Whore. Yeah. yeah, that's what that's what Danny DeVito says on "It's Always Sunny." He's like, I like banging whores. <laughs> I have a question for you, Justin. Yeah. 
Would it have improved your opinion on this film, say, if at the end uh, Kirsten would have, like, destroyed the Redeemer? Like, she would have survived, killed the, the evil, and, like, escaped. Would that have mattered to you? Or would you still have basically had the exact same opinion even if somebody did survive? Uh, I don't know. I, it's an interesting point. I think it probably would have improved it a little bit for me if she survived. Because I, but again, it's, uh, I, yeah, it was a bit because it was it was curious in so much. You got like films that are very downbeat seventies um, films because a lot of seventies films are very kind of sometimes downbeat and kind of like compu- completely kind of free of any humour or anything. Whereas the, the Redeemer was kind of, it was free of humour apart from the kind of gallows humour, wasn't it, basically, of people being killed um, yeah. in, in ways that are kind of approximate what the, the, their lifestyle is. And also you've got like this kind of, um, uh, you know, the whole thing of the, the, the forced jivality of kind of the clowns and mannequins and those, those type of things. So, um, you know, the, the, the Redeemer dressing up with the um, the black lipstick and the you know the sort of the fake cheeks. Ooh, your favourite type of lipstick. Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> you know, and uh, that kind well, of very theatrical kind of speech in the theatre, wasn't it, with, with the, the mannequin uh, next to him. It's kind of almost like cabaret. It was kind of so... It was it, it, it was a curious mix. Um, and I would love to know what the director actually... what he actually wanted to do, because... Um, I mean, I have some back- background on the movie, and you know, but I don't, you know, but I, I think the the fact, the fact, I won't get into that straight away. Apart from the fact that the director apparently was in his fifties when he made this, so the fact is that this is forty years ago. So the likelihood is he's dead now, probably. Um, so, so, um, uh, so we'll probably never know, will we? He probably took uh, took the enigma that is the Redeemer to his grave. I would think. Well, what we yeah. mentioned. What is- would it have improved your enjoyment of the film if Jensen Ackles had appeared in a G-string and done a little dance? Yes, it would have done. Okay, okay. <laughs> we was mentioned he alive the, uh... when this was filmed? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were probably... We mentioned the... Uh... Go ahead. No, no, you go ahead, yeah. No, I was just going to say, we mentioned the obvious inspiration for Slaughter High, but uh, I wonder if it inspired Terror Train with its switching costumes at all. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I did wonder that. And also Prom Night with the, you know, is this the first kind of film that had the kind of the yearbook with, they didn't quite cross them out, did, did they? But it's uh, it was, it was cutting them out with the scalpel or something, wasn't mm, the mm. Yeah, faces. Yeah. I really enjoyed, um, and, you know, maybe it was a little ahead of its time as well, but I liked Kirsten's, um, you know, the when they show the clip of her with her girlfriend. And I just thought it was real interesting how the girlfriend, I think she had some really good points because she was like, you know, at this reunion, although incidentally, none of them take their husbands or their wives with them. But she says, you know, at this reunion, your friends are going to have their husbands and their wives with them and I can't come with you. And she's like, are you ashamed of me? And I don't know. I thought that was actually a a really, you know, well thought out scene. And I don't know, I actually feel bad for her and her cat because now Kirsten's dead. Maybe she didn't die. Maybe oh, she no. got away somehow. <laughs> yeah. We didn't see dream. her die. We didn't, no. Maybe it was all somebody's dream. Maybe it was Sarah Kendall's dream from The Slayer. <laughs> there you go. But just, just in the, I have the film on the background here, and the scene where um, the actor guy gets killed has just cropped up, and I'm viewing it in a whole new light now after what you said, because the blood spurts out in a very suggestive manner, and then he starts twitching on the ground in kind of a, yeah. So I can kind of see where you're coming from with that. Mm. Um, read, reading of that scene. Well, it just it just occurred to me that it was. Um, it, it just seems seems a bit, uh, you know, that it seems because if it, if it was just being vain, then you would think if it was about was his was it supposed to be vain, you would think it, if that was the case, then the killer would do something where he would destroy his features, wouldn't he? He would kind of, yeah, yeah. you know, disfigure him rather than stick a, a kind of a phallic metal symbol through his top of his head, but. Who who knows? Who knows? That is one of the. Injuries. Although John's, I mean, I don't know if John's death, you know, the lawyer, um, really goes with you know his life. I mean, he just gets shot, and it, it didn't seem to be uh, any connection there for me. Even though I think well, there I is think, with some of the other deaths. I think John getting shot is kind of mirrors like he lets a lot of criminals go, and they probably have guns. So, mm. Mm. yeah. No, it's interesting. I did like the um, uh, the, the the killer having what the fakest moustache since the policeman in Sleepaway Camp. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> wasn't that fake? Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
But um, well, shall we shall we move on to some background? Um, Nathan, I imagine you have lots on this one. Well, I mean, all mine comes from your site, Justin, which I imagine we bought. We yeah, right, which is what I have as well. <laughs> I, was, I was reading. Um, you know, Lunch Meat did a, an interview with uh, T.G. Finkbinder or, mm. or Finkbender. I'm, I'm not sure how to say his last name. I'm going to say Binder. Mm. Um, well, just just as a little aside, just as mentioned that I saw there was reviews to start coming out about um, uh, the commentary did with uh, Arrow's Madhouse, and um, I think it's it, 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 um, one of them DVD drive-in or digital, uh, whatever it, is, it said. It was a, a, quite a, a good review. It was one that they generally like what we do. But they sort of um, mentioning about us um, massacring um, Acido Asinitis' uh, name throughout the country. <laughs> uh, that's why I didn't want to say Asinitis. it. Asinitis. Yes, I don't know. I have no idea. Um, oh, I actually have a really good story before I get into to this. This actually is from our very, very good friend, Amanda Reyes. Hmm. Um, when she was living in L.A., and she actually said, you've got to, I mean, she was like, you're going to tell that story, aren't you? And I was like, you know I am. Um, she, uh, was working, I believe it was in a bookstore and Janetta Arnett had came in and of course, um, Amanda started telling her how much she loved her in class reunion massacre. And she said, you know, I think Jeanette, Janetta was kind of surprised that, you know, that she was kind of remembered for class reunion massacre, but she said, uh, Janetta actually did her little scene where she's like, I've been married, divorced, I've had an annulment, and now I'm having lots of fun. And she's like, she quoted it verbatim, word mm. for word, wow. that she actually remembered that line. And I think that's so funny. <laughs> uh, I wish, I, I tried to find a way to contact her because I would love to have interviewed her, but unfortunately I couldn't uh, find her, you know, aside from, you know, just like her filmography and stuff like that. Um, but I mean, and what we were saying before about um, the review or the interview on Justin's site, I mean, most of my background, you know, came from that. So I'm sure we've, you know, we've probably all got a lot of stuff. So I'll just cover, you know, a few things um, there. Um, T.G. Finkbender's uh, favorite memory, <laughs> the most fun moment was driving around in Nikki Barton's Porsche, which he also mentions that Nikki, which is... Um, you know, the, the hunter woman that gets shot in the movie. Um, like she apparently was super, super rich. He also mentions that, um, uh, Michael Hollingsworth who played Roger was full of gossipy fun, which also kind of made me wonder, you know, if it was, uh, his character or, or, you know, just him, you know, uh, when we were talking about earlier, whether his character was in the movie meant to be a gay character. um, and uh, he uh, does. Uh, T.G. Finkbinder does say that he thinks that the double thumb thing was uh, the mark of Cain. Um, so, you know, take that for what you will. Um, I so didn't read Cain, up much about Cain the mark was, of Cain. Cain's definitely able to kill. That's your joke of the but week. A, that's uh, my yeah. joke of the week. Yeah. <laughs> Not that <fantastic. laughs> I didn't even get a, a bell or a crying woman or a tumble. <laughs> and uh, T.G. Finkbinder uh, is a high school English teacher now. And I actually read that, and I'm not sure how to say her name, but she played Kirsten. Gear? Gear? Do you guys know? It's G-Y-R. Mm, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not going to pronounce names anymore after we were Christmas. <laughs> Asinitis. <laughs> But um, I actually uh, read uh, up on her on the IMDb that it had just a little bit of trivia. Uh, I actually only saw one thing, but it was that she's a music teacher now at, uh, at a school. So I wouldn't mind talking to her either because this was the only movie she did. And I actually thought she was good in it. So you know, maybe she just didn't want to continue the, her acting career. But... Um, I'll let you guys read the rest of that interview. Well, who would like to go next? Uh, Joseph, have you got anything for us? No, I really didn't have much time to compile any background info this week. Okay. Well, um, okay. Eric. Yes. Okay. Well, I, again, I'm pilfering from the two uh, interviews that lunch did on your website, uh, Justin. So, um, yeah, T.G. Finkbinder also says it was filmed in July of 1976, which would have meant it was filming a month after The Omen was released. So it, it counteracts the theory that it was um, 
not influenced at all by the the omen um there's also an interview with the screenwriter william vernick on on hysteria lives and he says that his original script was more or less the middle 60 minutes of the film the slasher set in the school was his script and then they sort of added the prologue and the epilogue later um uh, but the director did this and like and he said he the screenwriter admits that he doesn't know really what's going on in those opening and closing moments of the film he says the f- finished film barely resembles what he wrote um uh, so he'd been a film editor uh, and he was doing post production work for uh, a film that the people who went on to produce the redeemer were working on uh, he sent them a 20 page treatment and they greenlit it almost immediately uh, uh, and he said it was one of the easiest sells he ever did um yeah, the film was released over here as The Redeemer. Was it originally released in the States as Class Reunion Massacre? Or was it yes. called, called, called The Redeemer and then retitled? No, okay. Well, I've seen both versions in the States, mm-hmm. but um, I, I ended up seeing the Class Union Massacre box a lot more than I ever saw The Redeemer box. So I, I'm assuming it got a wider release in that title. I'm just wondering if it got retitled yeah. maybe in the early 80s with the slasher boom to give it a more slasherific title. I don't, I don't well, I do know that... Yeah. The Go. Class Reunion Massacre was um, the, the the original release of that was like a like a standard SP VHS copy, whereas the Redeemer was like uh, it was like one of those cheapy kind of uh, they or I may be backwards, but it's one of those cheapy kind of they 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 put it in the, the really thin uh, tape. It's like they took a copy from the original and mm. just put it onto a different tape. Mm. I dub. Yeah. yeah. But the film, yeah, did, like that. yeah, the film did get. Uh, it was released to the cinema as the Redeemer, so I think that was that was the original title. Mm. That's more or less all I have, Justin. I'm afraid. So okay, well, thank you, Eric. Well, just a few few other bits was that um, in the interview, uh, um, the uh, Finkbinder says it's Finkbinder, isn't it? I'm getting names mixed up, but um, he sort of says he calls the um, the uh, director. He calls him by the name Connie. Um, and said that he was um, snockered, as he puts it most of the time, i.e. Um, a bit drunk, a bit tipsy on set. Um, and he was... Yeah, I wasn't sure if we were allowed to say that. <laughs> well, I mean, he says it. So, um, But uh, he said that the, the, the director was... Um, uh, he, he'd worked in television. I think he was a... Um, uh, he was an editor at NBC, um, and he said that his his wife was a younger, uh, a younger sort of woman, sort of um, much younger than him, like a flower child. Uh, who did all these amazing kind of um, drawings for for the movie? Kind of um, what they call storyboards. Um, the yeah, he said he did mention about the omen, so maybe he's just getting that mixed up, um, uh, sort of in in this. So he, and uh, I mean, there's not really much more apart from to say the film was shot in um, something called Staunton Military Academy, um, which was kind of uh, I think it was a, a school, um, a military school, which has kind of since been shut down in in uh, Virginia. Uh, um, oh, the the only other thing that I think it's mentioned was that he um, uh, he kind of uh, the the kid the kid um, at the beginning course it was called Christopher Flint, and um, they had to do some reshoots in 1977. Um, as I mentioned, the film didn't get released until 1978, and so he had to go back, and for some reason had to go back into um, go back into the lake, and he said it was really really cold. It was like January 1977 when they re- did some reshoots. Um, so he said his lips went blue, um, uh, and he was kind of, you know, on verge of hypothermia, I think. Uh, so I think that's, that's pretty much it. Apart from, I think he did say the other thing about the, about the thumbs, he hated the th- having those two thumbs. And he said, because it was so hot when they were shooting that, um, the thumbs kept on sliding, the extra thumb kept on sliding off. So it was kind of really uncomfortable and sort of, um, uh, sort of difficult, but, uh, but, um, yeah, apart from that, it's, I say, I think the. Yeah, it's a, a, an enigma in so much that, you know, literally, I don't think we'll ever find out what the director had in mind. But the fact is, if, and I say if he was drunk most of the time, then maybe he doesn't really know either. Um, so uh, maybe he had a huge blackout throughout the whole movie, and when he woke up, it really was a, like a kind of a booze dream. Who knows? But, uh, no, well, thank you, Nathan, for that. Is there anything else you want to oh, say you're about welcome. anything else you want to say about the uh, the Redeemer? I think we probably we probably got some. Uh, do we have much on the the Facebook group uh, for you to read, Joseph? Yeah, we have a few things. Okay, so we're doing that now, or well, might might as well. I think unless there's anything else you wanted to say, Nathan, about the film. Um, I love it. Okay, well, thank you. 
I just I just want to say I don't think the kid's arse is that fat. <laughs> I think you're exaggerating. I've seen fatter arses than that. I bet you have. Did you like his hair, Eric? No. No. Although if this was 1977, we'd all have hair like that. All of us. Every one of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, like a bell? Yep. Mm. So... The sound Joseph. of silence. Wow, Joseph. that was some awkward silence. <laughs> okay, uh, Facebook feedback. Justin Kosh says, I've never seen it. I was always under the impression that it wasn't a real horror movie, but rather some movie they packaged to look like a horror movie to dupe people into renting it on a Friday night. Damn, that was a long run-on sentence. Uh, Dave Rendon says, I remember renting this back around 1990 based on the box alone. Then I opened it, and someone wrote sucks on the tape after after the title. To make matters worse, the opening of the film itself was called The Redeemer, which also sucked. So I'm guessing he didn't like it. Well, how awful. It's amazing. Bob Hartshorn says, I first saw this back in the early 80s as The Redeemer and wasn't sure what to make of it. A recent rewatch under the CRM banner asserted its authority to me as one of the more superior, weird, and dare I say it, artier entries in the slasher pantheon. Creepy, gnarly, and downbeat, with an obnoxiously hypocritical, self-righteous mofo villain at the center. This baby is several cuts above its competitors, and the super surreal intro and outro are straight out of left field gold. An eerily effective and highly intelligent mini-classic. Louis Adams says, just watch this on YouTube and great rough looking grindhouse print in a great rough looking grindhouse print. Love the surreal tone, similar plot to Slaughter High, awesome kills and synth soundtrack could have done without the religious film flam flim flam. But overall, I enjoyed it. Jenny Hall Cameron says, been a while, but never can forget the creepo kid in the beginning. Six fingers or something. I've seen the movie twice, but don't remember anything but the kid. Someone dressed as a clown in this really has been a while. Might give it a revisit. And then she later writes, okay, I saw it again today. It was better than I remembered. I like the different guises that the killer had. Didn't care for all the religious crap, but I guess they had to have a tie in somehow. The kid at the beginning and end wasn't as creepy as I remember him being. I uh, felt the actor guy could have died differently. It's like he walked right into his death. Hey, you can kill me now. Movie was all right. Uh, David Cook says, gosh, starts off and ends in the druggy, zoned out style of early 70s indie horror with the souring of the hippie dream. The middle section turns into a version of And Then There Were None with an amateur cast, but some inventive kills. Having to clue what's going on, the YouTube version has a disjointed grindhouse feel. I'm glad I watched it. Let's see who's next uh, to get this off the screen here so I can see. Okay, Gavin Rye says, This was so ahead of its time, you could be mistaken for thinking it's cliched and full of the usual slasher tropes. But it's a good two or three years before they've even had the chance to be cliches. The kills are pretty good, too. The blowtorch scene being a highlight. Uh, Mike Alishan says picture slaughter high, but then amp everything up by 10 and then you get class reunion massacre. Such a mean spirited, weird slasher film. Uh, the movie is peppered with ambiguity too. Like the scene, like the scenes of the satanic kid popping out of the lake at the beginning and then going back into the, at the end, the costumes, the killer appears in are creepy as hell. The grim reaper one in particular, where the killer decides to frolic in front of our characters with only a fence to separate them. The bathroom drowning scene is so lengthy and grueling, I felt so bad for that character. This film is one of the first true slashers. You can shave off the word proto at this stage. I also wonder which movie started filming first, Redeemer or Halloween, and if the former aped off the latter in any way. Uh, I think this was filmed well before Halloween. Yeah. Uh, Mike Paul Sanders says, uh, This one I originally hated because I didn't really understand just what in the hell was going on. You had this kooky priest talking about sinners and sin on the one hand, 
uh, no pun intended if you're familiar with the movie, while then you have these six people being selected to attend this reunion being picked off one by one by the same priest. But you're left wondering, one, how does this guy know these people? And two, did he kill these hand-picked classmates before or after the opening sermon? However, over the years, my feelings have changed to where I think it's more disturbing than scary, especially with the cruel kills and a rather downbeat ending. Uh, the kill in the ladies' room with the killer dressed up in a clown mask was incredibly brutal, and with and the dancing puppet on stage was very creepy. The victims were likable for the most part, as none of them deserve to be killed, unlike today when you have people so obnoxious and mean-spirited in a movie to the point where you find yourself siding with the killer to butcher them off in the most torturous ways possible. While I don't recommend it to the casual viewer, I'd say it's worth looking into if you're into a pre-slasher oddity. Hashtag poor Cindy. Uh, Sean Gam- Gamble says, I got the Code Red DVD. You got to break it out and see if it holds up. I hope Sean Gamble has done that. Andrew Rooney says, Haven't seen it, but I formally request Cat Flushing the Toilet a cappella version by Eric. So, Eric. Oh, Eric. Yes. A cappella Cat Flushing the Toilet. He's a cat. Meow. Flushing the toilet. He's a cat. Meow. Flushing the toilet. He's a cat. Meow. Flushing the toilet. He's a cat. Flushing the toilet. There you go, uh, Andrew Rooney. Very good. Stephen Simon, <laughs> Stephen Symington says, "Haven't seen it yet, but I think it's on YouTube. I will watch it soon." And finally, Simon Logan. <gasps> yes, that's Simon Logan. Says nothing again. You're really oh, pushing Simon. Luck, Simon Logan. He's really pushing his luck. Yes. So that's it. <clears throat> Excellent. All right. Well, thank you everyone for writing in. Can I, can I just say one thing? I've not. I've, I've just noticed that uh, IMDb lists, lists a goof in the film, which is that at the very end of the film, Christopher walks back into the lake and submerges. Once submerged, the scene cuts to a much more broad picture of the lake in the credits, and you can see him walking on the right side of the picture up a pathway. So I'm wondering if the, did anyone notice that? I just watched it here, and he is there. It's almost oh. insinu- it insinuates he's almost come out of the lake, and he's off in his travels again to cause more mayhem. Because as you know, I, never not- I didn't notice yeah. that. No. Yeah. Mm. yeah. There's also I've noticed that the first assistant cameraman is called David Gasp Eric. Gasp <laughs> Eric is his surname. <gasps> oh. yeah. The gasp is back. The gasp is back, indeed. Well, thank you for everyone who who wrote in or wrote on the Facebook wall. That is great. I'll play you. This is how to get in contact with the show, and then we'll be coming back shortly to talk about what we're going to be covering. Oh, no, I've got a bit of feedback as well to read. I do oh, too. have you? Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't realise. Well, should we play the contact details anyway? Because I need a loo yeah. break. Yeah. So, yes. okay. Okay. The content of this podcast was provided by Justin Kurzweil, Eric Frillfall, Nathan Johnson, and Joseph Henson. If you enjoy our program and are willing and able to provide a donation, please visit us on Patreon and become a content designated subscriber. That's patreon.com forward slash the hysteria continues. For non subscriber PayPal donations and general feedback, our address is the.hysteria.continues at gmail.com. To listen and interact, simply search for the hysteria continues on iTunes, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Susie versus Toya forever. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for listening to that, and please do get in contact with the show. Um, we do have a few bits of feedback, don't we? So, uh, Eric, yep. would you like to go first? Yes, this is from our friend Declan Gallagher. He says, Hey there, guys, I was so fond of your last episode that I was compelled to drop you an email. What an absolute delight it was to hear Amanda's take on all those TV movies. I found myself pausing every couple of minutes to jot down a new title. Made for a wonderful Sunday afternoon as I rode my bike to a retrospective screening of the original Haunting, which I had somehow never seen. Like Eric, I often deride TV movies because they're too slow or just not gory and sleazy enough. But after hearing Amanda's passionate opinions, I think I have been looking in the wrong places. Last night, I watched Night Terror and Someone's Watching Me, both terrific. And tonight, I'm going to dip into The Girl Most Likely To and the wonderfully titled Diary of a Female Hitchhiker. I have the next three weeks off before starting on another job, and I have a feeling much of that time will be spent at a legitimate brick-and-mortar rental shop looking for physical copies of these easy-to-find films. Can Amanda come back every week? And as always, thanks for all you guys do. Uh, You continue to get better and better with each passing year, and your episodes are consistently delightful. All the best, Declan G, Declan Gallagher. Well, thank you, Declan. Yes. And indeed it was. It's always a delight to have Amanda Reyes on. Exactly. Yes. You should listen exactly. to her Made for TV Mayhem podcast, mm. which has there's some she has some co-hosts, isn't she on that? 
Yeah. I'm shamelessly plugging because I'm <laughs> one of the co-hosts. Yeah. No, but it is really so What's good. your name again? Uh, the Redeemer. Oh. Yeah, he's going to redeem us all now. Mm. Thanks, I am. I'm gathering you all somewhere for the redemption. So, Nathan, if you had to redeem us, what, how would you redeem us? <clears throat> Oh, wow. Um, that's a very, very good question. And I you'd, don't you'd, have, like, something that's You'd be suffocated to, by a black veil. Yeah. I would think yours would be goth-related, Justin. Mm-hmm. It would be something very gothy. You know, you'd probably die in a graveyard. Okay. Well, you know, that would be very existential. Okay. Eric, I would probably kill him with chunky Kit Kats. Mm, fair enough. What a way yeah. to go. Yeah. And, um, oh, Joseph, hmm, how would I kill you, Joseph? Let me think about this for a minute. You'd probably just uh, show me criminally insane or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, yeah, maybe. I mean, you don't really mind criminally insane. It's Crazy Fat Ethel 2 that you hated. Yes. <laughs> so I'd show you that. I mean, I would. You, you'd basically be tied up, and you would have to watch Crazy Fat Ethel 2 on repeat for, I don't know, you know, probably about... You know, for for as long as it takes until you decide you just can't take it anymore. It's a bit like that Black Mirror episode, you know, the one where they um, the Christmas special where <clears> they <throat> they punish that person oh, yeah. by you know putting them their, their every their kind of punishment is that they kind of reliving or they're kind of living a certain scene in their life forever or for years instead of prison. So that's what it could be. That could be a rare punishment indeed. Hmm. Uh, yes, I think I think it would be very uh, fitting punishment. Although, see, now if it was me, I would enjoy it. Well, so it wouldn't be a punishment yeah. for me, mm. but for Joseph, it would. Well, do we? Well, and uh, well, thank feedback. you, De- thank you, Declan. And uh, well, I'm sure we will be having Amanda back on the show at some point in the near future. We'll be announcing a co-host coming up next, uh, a special co-host for the next episode a little bit later on. But uh, uh, Nathan, uh, you have some feedback. Yes, and this is from, uh, you know, one of our favorite listeners, uh, Tosca. You guys know who I'm talking about, right? Tosca Top Socks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, He says, hey, guys, a very long time, no speaky. Here's hoping you are all well. It has been radio silence for me for a few months as my company have recently been taken over, and so my thoughts and a lot of time have been elsewhere. However, I would never desert you cheeky chappies, and you have kept me sane through a few recent dark times. I almost thought my world was ending when I heard Eric was going to leave the show. Thank God he had a change of heart. You all realize that none of you can ever leave, ever. (laughs) Joking aside, though, the chemistry between you all is magic and getting stronger, and you are now getting quite a few mentions in the various horror press. The last few episodes have been fabulous as ever, and you can also tell Amanda that she has a new fan. Couldn't resist buying her new book, and this has now got me into a TV movie kick. Most recently seen Home for the Holidays and Five Desperate Women. Oh, those movies are great. Uh, don't know what it is about TV movies from the 70s. They just make you feel all warm and fuzzy. Please pass on my congratulations to Mrs. Reyes for producing a top-notch read. On this topic, when are you doing another book, Justin? Best wishes all. Love, Tosca. Oh, that's very nice. Yeah, thank you, Tosca. I'd love to hear from you. Um... I well, I might be doing. I did. Um, I might be doing another book at some point um, uh, in the future. It looks uh, possibly likely something might be on the horizon. So, but I can't really talk about it too much at the moment. But um, uh, apart from I'm doing um, a retrospective on Toya's career, um, it's a pamphlet. But um, <laughs> it's a pamphlet. I say, I say it's a leaflet. It's like a leaflet. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be out on very cheap paper. In fact, it's actually going to be—it's going to be sin, sin, um, toilet like, paper. Well, exactly. It's going to be on, uh, yeah, on a toilet roll. But anyway, no. But there, there may be a, a real book coming out at some point in the future. But it won't be on Toya. Well, I'm going to write a book on Toya, and I'm going to release it the same day as your book and rain on your parade. Okay. Well, I think it might have a different audience. Although I know that people do. There's quite a lot of people out there who like um, Toya. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Well, no, there is, and, isn't there? Oh. No, no, there is. There's still I, thought there, there. I thought there was some horrible joke coming up. No, no, no. She has a, it's a genuine fan base. So I'm not dis- disputing that. You know. Yeah, I'm waiting for the horrible punchline still. No, there's no horrible punchline. I'm just saying that she has a genuine fan base still. Yeah, she does. Yeah, so anyway. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so oh, thank, yes, thank you, Tosca, for reigniting that little debate. And Tosca um, is from Birmingham, which is the home of the lovely Toya. 
Yeah, yeah. When is uh, Celebrity so, Cash so in lucky. the Attic on again? Sorry? When is Celebrity Cash in the Attic on again? I don't know. I'll check the listings and see. Or okay. Ce- Celebrity Antiques Road Trip as well. Is that the one when she was on a barge? No, that was a different one. <laughs> celebrity what? Antiques Road Trip, she was driving around with Tony Blackburn looking for bargains. Okay. So, Eric, anyway. you scared so many people when you were, you know, you almost thought of leaving us. No, I feel so bad. Does it make you feel good, though, that all these people were, like, so upset about it? It because, does, actually. I mean, it's because yeah. they all like you so much. I know. They that like wasn't, you. They really, wasn't really the, like you. I know. That wasn't the point of the episode. So. <laughs> no, Which no. Makes, I mean, uh, it was it, makes, it, it does was make me feel like Ross Geller. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Well, we shall be continuing as long as you'll have us, hopefully. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. But, uh, okay. Well, um, any other feedback? I don't think I've got anything. Joseph, you got anything? No, the only thing I have is uh, the continuation of my game. So Okay, yeah. And I've got after the credits, so yes. just so well, y'all are aware. Well, do you want to uh, – well, let's, let's do those then. So your continuation of the game, because obviously we also – do you want to give the results? Because you've had a couple of games on the uh, – on Hysteria Continues also. Yeah, right? we had mm. – we had like a versus game and obvious, obvious Halloween one. Mm. I'm not too thrilled with that because I was hoping for a kind of a more underrated film. But, you know, it deserves it. So congratulations, Halloween. Now there's another one where we're just basically doing uh, it's similar, but you do like ratings out of 10. And then I do math and see what the the the, the mean total is from all the votes and the points. Uh, be interesting to see which has the highest points and which has the lowest. And so far, um, what, what movie is it that has the lowest so far? I think it's Crazy Fat Ethel Two. What? It's like a <laughs> has like a one point three. I can't remember. Lower than Axum. Check. Yeah, it's lower than Axum. I Whoa. am shocked and appled at this. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. Well, the problem is it didn't get very many votes. Whereas Axum actually got more than a, a handful of votes, so um, there you go. Anyway, this game is the What Movie Am I Thinking Of? And we did have a correct guess last time. Uh, it was Ryan Moritz. He correctly guessed Cheerleader Camp, so he gets a point. Anyway, the movie I'm thinking of now, it's a new movie. The first clue is Michael Berryman. The second clue is And the Skipper too. And finally, clue number three is nine to five. I know. You know what oh, it is? I do know what it is. I okay. do too. It's nine to five, isn't it? With Dolly Parton <laughs> yes. and Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin. Well, now i got to come up with a new movie now. Thanks a lot. Sorry, I ruined it. That classic slasher, <laughs> nine to five. <laughs> well, after well, it could be this show. Who knows? Um the uh, But, Eric, well, when we're off air, <laughs> then uh, yeah. maybe you'll, you can test your theory. I can. So, yeah. um, so, well, thank you, Joseph. So, everyone, have a go on that one. Um, and um, Nathan, after the credits. So, so we know now, mm. and Eric brought this to my attention because I didn't notice it, but I watched it just now after he mentioned it that the kid actually does leave the lake at the end. Now, I'm assuming that's not a, um, you know, a goof. I think it was intentional, and it leads us into what happens after the credits. So, what do you guys think? What do you think happens next? Does he go and, like, take over another priest? Kill off some more people? He goes to get a haircut. Mm. Not back in those times. Oh, they didn't have barbers back then? Maybe he goes to get a train that will pick him up in the middle of nowhere. Maybe he goes to kill his his tailor. Oh, that was next. He kills Liz Taylor. (laughs) No, his tailor. (laughs) (laughs) I know where he's going. He's going to go star on Celebrity Cash in the Attic with Toya. <laughs> hey. I would be well, interested. Well, the danger... I, I'd watch oh, go that. ahead. No, I was just going to say I would watch that, though. <laughs> yeah, of course the you Redeemer would, yeah. uh, would be upset today because in today's times, these like little sins, they're pale in comparison to you I know, know. what you'll find today. So I'm well, like... Sure it's fornication left, right, and center everywhere you look. <laughs> All right. So my take on After the Credits is very, very simple. Um, obviously Kirsten did survive because, I mean, come on, it's a puppet. How hard could it stab somebody? So I think she did get a gash, like across, you know, her, you know, maybe her shoulder. 
Like, you know, it sliced through her shoulder. She got some medical attention and she went back to live her happy life with her, um, you know, lesbian friend who plays badminton with uh, Justin. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there you go. There you go. go. How's Kirsten doing lately, Justin? Um, She's got some form, but uh, her backhand (laughs) needs some work. Uh, I think it's because of her shoulder injury from the puppet. That's probably yeah. it. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you, Nathan. Is that well? Uh, it would be interesting to see all these kind of final girls and people who who did you know, especially as, as it was dream logic. Uh, she could meet up with Alice from Friday Thirteenth Part Two, couldn't she? Yeah, who's not mm. dead at all? They could make some coffee. Yeah, and tap so. tap the top of the coffee jar for about ten minutes. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. So, uh, is there anything else we wanted to mention? I'm just going to want a quick shout out to uh, uh, Don Nice on the Flashback Horror Movie Podcast. I did an episode uh, with with him and his co-host uh, where we discussed um, uh, this podcast and my book and slasher movies in general, and that was good, a lot of fun. So, well, they call me Inga on it. Well, yeah, he wants you on the show, and he wants um, Nathan right. and Joseph. As he didn't well, call so. me anything on it. Well, he, <laughs> Be he almost did. Just, just Justin jumped jumped in in time. So. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Don. I'm just kidding. I thought it was very funny. Yeah. So that was uh, that was very that was a uh, that was a lot of fun. So yeah, definitely worth checking out. And um, also, um, shall I mention what we're going to be doing next time? Yes, please, Don. Yes. yes. Well, we're back to listener picks, and we are going to be joined by Bill Ackerman from the Supporting Characters podcast, another podcast that I've. I've um, guested on in the past, and Whore. Mm, what? Whore. Whore. Oh, oh, Eric! I'm sure you can catch. I'm sure you <laughs> Whore, can sorry, Whore. 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 Sailor. Yeah. yeah. And um, his choice uh, for us to cover is uh, Alice Sweet Alice, aka Communion, um, which is another proto slasher. So uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. More so religious stuff too. Yeah, more religious cool. stuff as well. So. So as an ex-Catholic, that will be an interesting one for me to cover. Um, uh, so, yes, we'll be doing that next time. Um, and uh, I don't know if there's anything else we want to say or need to say, um, apart from um, we will see you next time. And we'll be playing out with some music, I think, from The Redeemer. And, uh, of course, they, uh, that Susan the Banshee song, The Redeemer. Actually, no, this is not from The Redeemer. Oh, what is it then? This is... Uh, this is Listen to Reason, which is uh, the atheist anth- anthem on the atheist experience. So I thought to go against religion, I would play the atheist anthem. Listen to Reason by Brian Steeksma, I think it's his name. Okay. So there you go. They should, they Do should. Susie and the Banshees have a song called The Redeemer? No, they don't. No. Yeah, I was thinking. <laughs> They do now. No, okay. Well, no, that's what we'd be playing out with. So um, we should yeah. no, we should play some Toya because she's class. And this is class. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's my joke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, okay, we'll see you all next time. So thanks for listening to History Hysteria Continues. And um, yeah, say goodbye to the good people. Bye. Bye, goodbye, good and people. Go buy the copy of The Slayer when it comes out, please. Thank yes, you. Please do. <laughs> <laughs>